He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. Kia ora, I'm William Ray. Welcome to Black Sheep. We're in London. It's 1829 and we're sitting in a cell at Newgate Prison. What's happening in this prison cell will change history. The man inside is writing a letter, well, actually, a series of letters, all on the same topic. All trades, pursuits and professions are becoming more and more overstocked, and multitudes of persons of all degrees and ages are moving about without employment, useless to themselves and a burden to the public. These letters are a blueprint for the future of the British Empire, and particularly the future of New Zealand. Colonisation will be conducted systematically with a view to the greatest benefit of the mother country. The man writing them is called Edward Gibbon Wakefield. If you read biographies from the first half of the 20th century, this guy is a hero. He's literally described as the father of New Zealand, and not just New Zealand, the whole British Commonwealth. He was the most practical statesman of the 19th century. This strange, far-sighted man of enormous mental and physical energies was the founder of an empire. But other biographies have a different, maybe more black sheepy take on Edward Gibbon Wakefield. Wakefield had some merit as a thinker, and he was a publicist of genius. As a practical coloniser, he was a menace. Also, he once abducted and married a teenage girl. That's why he was locked up in Newgate Prison in the first place. He can be um, despised on some levels, admired on others. Um, what I, I don't think what can be denied is that he's an utterly fascinating individual. This is Dr Philip Temple, author of A Sort of Conscience. A uh, flawed personality and uh, a past which um, dogged him forever, channelling these incredible energies and ideas wherever he saw an opening. Dr Temple's book is a biography not just about Edward Gibbon Wakefield, but the whole Wakefield family, including his two sisters, six brothers, mother, father and grandparents. The family came from Cumbria in England. Mostly they were Quakers. That's a Protestant Christian denomination, in case you're not familiar. Like a lot of Quakers, the Wakefields had made quite a lot of money in banking. They were part of a growing middle class in early 19th century England. But that didn't mean Edward Gibbon's early life was all smooth sailing. Edward Gibbon's grandfather uh, lost his money. So they had the status, but not the cash. And then this was all occurring during the period of the French Revolution and the start of the Napoleonic Wars. So there's a lot of uh, turbulence politically and socially and, of course, the gathering momentum of the Industrial Revolution. And on top of this, Wakefield's family was a bit of a mess. His father was a pretty unreliable character and his mum was often badly ill. She suffered delusions and hallucinations. They lived on a farm in Essex which... Um, was um, full of malaria. <laughs> England wasn't free of malaria until, you know, about mid-19th century. So his mother was beset by malaria and nine, bearing nine children. His father was off either philandering with other women or uh, involved in his, his pact reform projects, which involved agricultural reform, but also the reform of lunatic asylums, and uh, the beginnings of universal primary education. So it was a very turbulent period. The family was really held together by Edward's grandmother, Priscilla Wakefield, who basically acted as a sort of de facto parent to him and his siblings. Priscilla did her best for her grandkids, but they still had a rocky start. And even from the very beginning, Priscilla had worries about Edward, her eldest grandson. As she said in one letter... His obstinacy, if he inclines to evil, terrifies me. Wakefield went to three schools. He was expelled from two and refused to attend the final one. According to one of his classmates, he was a troublemaker. 
On one occasion, he passed himself off as a blind fiddler and performed his part so well amongst his everyday acquaintances that not one of them discovered the joke. The cheating of policemen was another favourite joke. I mean, he, he was clearly one of those children who are disruptive, but often because they, don't, they can't work with the status quo or have got other ideas. And it's often those people who turn out to be, of course, uh, leaders or innovators in, in, in society. Yeah, I mean, you sort of think of the, all the high school dropouts have gone on to become massive innovators and multimillionaires. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was also clearly, I think, probably from an early age, had the gift of the gab, and also uh, he was a damn good writer. <laughs> These talents landed Wakefield his first job. When he was 18 years old, he started working for the British Diplomatic Service. It was a busy time for diplomacy in Europe. The French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte had just been defeated at Waterloo, ending a series of wars which had raged all over the continent for 12 years or so. He had the role as a kind of diplomatic messenger uh, between the British Embassy in Paris and London. So he's travelling backwards and forwards in that... You mentioned the state of Paris uh, after Waterloo and the fall of Napoleon and um, all the different occupying forces from the uh, Allied side. So it's an incredibly turbulent time and um, no doubt very stimulating, as you can imagine, for a, for a young bloke like him. And he sort of develops a sort of, I don't know whether you'd call him sort of an alternative father figure in this diplomat that, that, who he's working for. William Hill, yes, he kind of took care of him. Someone like EGW from a really good family, but without any substantial means, they, they had to look for a patron. And uh, William Hill was uh, EGW's initial patron, uh, looking after him and trying to get him a good role in the diplomatic service. And, of course, this went on so that he was in later on a consul in uh, Turin in Italy. So now Wakefield was 20 years old and on the rise. His real dream was to become a member of parliament, but to do that, he needed a lot of money. Like back in his day, it was pretty much impossible to have a career as a politician unless you were the equivalent of a multi-millionaire. Luckily, Wakefield had a scheme to get his hands on that kind of cash, and it involved eloping with 16-year-old Eliza Pattle, heir to a gigantic family fortune. Yes, he was um, in, in London and saw this young woman with her widowed mother, uh, across the road from where he was living. And um, this was a kind of um, accepted <laughs> mode for well-bred young men who didn't have much property or money was to marry an heiress because, let's face it, in those days, women were o almost as much property as house or land. And eloping with a suitable heiress was actually something that was quite common there were actually three of those Wakefield brothers eloped, and not only EGW, but also his brother Dan and brother William. But this wasn't just about the money. After the wedding, Wakefield wrote that he was mad with animal joy, while Eliza wrote, What a lovely thing it is to marry and to be so happy as to wish for nothing. It was a, a definite love match. Uh, there was no, no element of abduction. They just took off. And in fact, his grandmother knew about it and gave, gave them her blessing. So that, that, that was actually, a f for a time, looked ideal that he was, he was staying in the diplomatic service. He'd married an heiress who would come into all this cash when she turned 21. The couple had two children, first a girl called Nina, then a boy called Edward Jerningham. That's when it all went wrong. She died only a few months before her 21st birthday, giving birth to their son, Jerningham. A few months after Eliza died, Wakefield sent a letter to his sister Catherine. I feel unable to form any plans of life because each view of my future existence presents the same dreary prospect, the same hourly recurring want of that cheerful, happy face, lightened up as it was by manners and habits so exactly suited to my taste and inclination. Reading through those letters, 
you really are almost moved to tears. Eliza's death was obviously a massive personal tragedy for Edward Gibbon Wakefield, but it was also a financial disaster for the whole Wakefield family. The thing is, because Eliza died before she turned 21, she wasn't old enough to inherit her family fortune. And that meant most of the cash which would have gone to Wakefield instead went to Eliza's mother. The family as a whole uh, were actually relying on EGW to, you know, provide stability and material uh, security. And so the death of uh, Eliza was was catastrophic, uh, uh, not only emotionally for EGW, but also for the his and the family's prospects. This is the first time where you see the more ruthless side of Edward Gibbon Wakefield. Because despite those rules around the inheritance, Wakefield still got about £70,000 from Eliza's estate. That's about $14 million in today's money. But a lot of that cash had to be held in trust for his kids, and believe it or not, he still didn't have enough money to achieve his ambition of becoming an MP. So he launched a lawsuit against Eliza's mother, trying to overturn the will and get more money. And the tactics he used in this court case were pretty underhanded. He used completely false premises and so-called documentation and, of course, lost. About six years after Elias's death, Wakefield came up with an even more ruthless get-rich-quick scheme. It involved marrying another heiress, Alan Turner, daughter of William Turner, a very rich and influential landowner. EGW's reasoning was, get married to Alan Turner, the old man will not only give her a good dowry, but also will will, uh, sponsor me getting into Parliament. That was the whole thing. Here's the problem. By this point, Edward Gibbon Wakefield was 30 years old. Alan Turner was 15. And the two had never met before. This was nothing like Wakefield's elopement with Eliza. His plan to marry Alan Turner involved straight-up child abduction. Here's what happened. First, Wakefield sent a servant to Alan's boarding school. He had a fake message from a doctor which claimed Alan's mum had suffered a sudden illness and was partially paralysed. It said, Though I do not think Mrs Turner is in immediate danger, it is probable that she may soon become incapable of recognising anyone. Sounds pretty serious. So the school sent Alan off with the servant. They jumped into a carriage supposedly to go see her sick mum. The carriage stopped for the night at a hotel. This is where Edward Gibbon Wakefield came into the scene. He met with Alan and revealed a totally different reason why she'd been yanked out of school. Wakefield said he was a friend of Alan's father. He sat down and told Alan that the whole story about her mum being sick was a front. The real problem was her dad. Wakefield told Alan her dad was badly in debt and was on the run from his creditors. Wakefield claimed he'd been sent to bring her to meet him. This was yet another lie. Really, Wakefield was giving an excuse to get closer to Alan. He put it like this in a statement to the public after the whole scheme was revealed. My determination to marry Miss Turner was clogged with three very reasonable conditions. They were, first, that I should find her to be the sort of person that I could love and cherish for her own sake. Secondly, that I should bring her to believe that she would be happy in marrying me. And thirdly, that I would not use force or the shadow of force. All very noble and chivalrous. Of course he wasn't going to force a 15-year-old girl to marry him. He was just going to trick her into it. Anyway, Wakefield convinced himself that Alan Turner really was marriage material, despite being literally half his age. 
She felt no alarm in my company because her judgment allowed her to see and feel the great pains that I took to treat her with the delicate and respectful yet tender kindness. Marriages, it has said, are made in heaven. Ours was made by the first two hours of conversation. By which he meant two hours of straight-up lies. The next day, Wakefield told Alan he'd received a letter. It turned out Wakefield's uncle had agreed to pay Alan's dad's debts. Phew. But of course, Alan's dad was now in debt to Wakefield's uncle, which was still a pretty awkward situation. If only there was some way to sort of unify their family so the debt could just be cancelled. Wait, of course, that's the solution. You should marry me. And then my uncle will settle matters and it will save your father from being turned out of doors and all your family from destruction. By now, Ellen has been with Wakefield for more than 24 hours. It's been a whirlwind of emotions. First she thinks her mum is sick and paralysed. Then she thinks her whole family is about to be bankrupted. Now... It feels like she's been given a lifeline, a way to save her whole family. Ellen repeatedly asked if she could go see her dad to get his advice on this whole situation, but Wakefield gave all kinds of excuses for why they couldn't reach him. Eventually, she said yes. She later explained, I was induced to consent by the fear that if I did not, my papa would be ruined. If it means saving her dad she'll marry this total stranger. Wakefield's thrilled, and he doesn't waste a moment. I tailed it up to Gretna Green, just across the Scottish border, where you could get married at, the, uh, at that time at the age of 12, as long as the, you know, the two parties were consenting. And then he uh, took off and crossed the channel to Calais. Now, the interesting thing here is that he could have kept going, and or could have consummated the marriage, but he didn't do either. He thought, well, I've, I've done that, now I'll wait and, and negotiate with her father. So it's possible Wakefield decided not to have sex with Ellen because it would have been immoral. It's also possible that he was worried about provoking her family into challenging him to a duel. Instead, Wakefield tried to convince Ellen's dad to go along with this marriage. He wrote to him saying... I have done you an unpardonable injury, and I feel that in your situation I should be furious with the man who had dared to marry my daughter without my consent. Still, I hope that in a similar case I should suspend my judgment till I could learn all the facts. He seems to have gambled that her father would would basically go along with this marriage to avoid the sort of drama and scandal of taking him to court. Yes, yes, that's right. Um, he, he completely misjudged the character of the father. Uh, another father might have gone along with it. But, but the key thing here, believe it or not, is that if Edward Gibbon had consummated the marriage, probably the father would have had no option. Because, if you like, Ellen Turner would then be damaged goods. She wouldn't have uh, been able to marry anybody in the social climate of the times. Wakefield did get one thing right in that letter. Ellen's father was furious. A week after the wedding, his brother, Ellen's uncle, arrived in Calais to meet Ellen and Wakefield, along with a lawyer and a police officer. They took Ellen aside and finally revealed the truth about Edward Gibbon Wakefield. According to one newspaper, she turned to him and yelled, I am not your wife! I will never go near you again. You have deceived me. And that was basically that. Wakefield was hauled into court in London to face trial for abduction. I mean, it was one of the great, great scandals of, of 1826. Several books were written just about the whole business. I mean, it really was uh, 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 one of the most notorious cases of the 19th first half of the 19th century. And it ruins him forever in some ways. Well, it, it, sort of, it, it certainly ruins any chance he's got of getting into Parliament. Yeah, child abductor isn't the best thing to have on your CV as a politician. 
The marriage was annulled, Wakefield was convicted and sentenced to three years in Newgate Prison. A lot of people felt that sentence was far too light, including the Home Secretary, Robert Peel, who wrote, Three years' imprisonment fell very short indeed of the punishment which ought to follow such a crime. Hundreds of delinquents, much less guilty than Wakefield, without the advantages of education which he possessed, had been convicted of capital felonies and had forfeited their lives. Edward Gibbon Wakefield didn't go to prison alone. His brother William and his stepmother Frances were also jailed for helping him with the scheme. But the Wakefields had a pretty easy ride in Newgate. In 19th century Britain, being a rich inmate came with some pretty sweet perks. You could actually live in a little kind of uh, apartment of your own and get uh, stuff brought in, (laughs) food and um, books and things like that. Yep, back in the 1820s, you could even bring servants into jail with you if you were rich enough. But life in Newgate still brought Wakefield face-to-face with the darker side of 19th century Britain. I describe in the book him attending uh, these trials where the poor of London, who, you know, might have stolen a loaf of bread, (laughs) were uh, sent off... uh, to the hulks in the Thames or transported to Australia. He, 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 it gave him the opportunity to see what was going on um, in the bottom half of society at first hand and hearing their stories. This is where his own and his family's sense of justice and reform comes in. Remember, the Wakefield family were Quakers and Quakers were often heavily involved in humanitarian reform efforts. We mentioned earlier Wakefield's dad worked to reform asylums. He also had a prison reforming cousin and a grandma who set up a savings bank for the poor. Edward Gibbon himself, he had a kind of split morality. He could be horrifically ruthless, like we've just seen with Alan Turner, but he could also be compassionate. And what he saw in Newgate Prison seemed to bring out that side in him. All these poor wretches being just sort of flipped off to Botany Bay or wherever. He thinks, what what to do? What to do? Well, at first, Wakefield tried to shine a light on what he was seeing. He published first-hand accounts from inside Newgate Prison, like this scene from the final church service for a group of condemned men. The young stealer no longer has the least pretense to bravery. He grasps at the back of the pew, his legs give way, he utters a faint groan and sinks to the floor. Why does no one stir to help him? Where would be the use? The hardened burglar moves not, nor does he speak, but his face is of an ashy paleness, and if you look carefully you may see blood trickling from his lip which he has bitten unconsciously. The poor sheep stealer is in a frenzy. He throws his hands far from him and shouts aloud, Mercy, good Lord, mercy is all I ask. The Lord in his mercy comes. There, there, I see the Lamb of God. Oh, how happy. Oh, this is happy. As Dr Temple said earlier, Wakefield was a damn good writer. Articles like this got a fair bit of attention. They may even have helped inspire Charles Dickens in his own writing about Newgate Prison. But Wakefield didn't just write about prison. He also wrote about the inequality which helped drive crime, and about the attitudes of the ruling classes. Everywhere the rich are ostentatious in the display of wealth and enjoyment. Whilst in their intercourse with the poor, they are suspicious, quick at taking offence, vindictive when displeased, haughty, overbearing, tyrannical and wolfish. And it wasn't just poor people who were under pressure in 19th century Britain. People in Edward Gibbon Wakefield's own class often had trouble finding work. Lawyers, clerks, engineers. Young men of his own generation had become part of what was called an uneasy class. There were an increasing number of them who had no good chances of employment. The whole structure of society was changing uh, with the you know, mounting effect of the Industrial Revolution and the increase of population and all that sort of stuff. So there had to be an outlet somewhere. So big problems for the whole society. But what was the solution? 
Lots of people had different ideas. Thomas Malthus thought cutting back on charity might help. Karl Marx reckoned a socialist revolution was the way to go. Edward Gibbon Wakefield spent his time in prison developing another idea. Colonisation. This is going to take a bit of explanation, so just stick with me for a few minutes. By this point in history, tons of people had already realised that colonies acted a bit like a release valve for social pressure. They were a way for poor Brits to escape poverty, acted as a dumping ground for convicts. But economically speaking, the colonies were a mess. For one thing, they often suffered a major shortage of labour. Wakefield identified this as the critical problem holding the colonies back. Every day sees an increase in the number of employers of labour without a proportionate increase in the number of labourers. The problem was land in the colonies was super cheap or even just free. And what kind of self-respecting colonist is going to want to go work on someone else's farm when they could afford to buy land of their own? What then are we to do? to obtain that desirable proportion between the demand and supply of labour, without which I say no country can flourish. Well, Wakefield had an answer for his own question. Systematic colonisation. Step one, make land expensive. It is suggested that a payment in money per acre be required for all future grants of land without exception. Wakefield figured that if you kept land prices artificially high, poor people wouldn't be able to afford it, which meant they'd have no choice but to work as labourers. But that raised another problem. It was pretty expensive to sail all the way around the world, so why would anyone become a colonist if they weren't going to get cheap land? Wakefield's idea was to take the profit from land sales to rich people and use it to give poor people free rides to the colony. Would not this system of colonisation be in effect a bridge without toll, taking the poor from Britain to Australasia? Plus, because you control who gets the tickets, you can make sure you have the right mix of skilled workers in this new colony. Masons, carpenters, glaziers, painters, blacksmiths. So now you've solved the labour problem. And Wakefield reckoned that would encourage more middle-class people to come to the colony too. Lawyers, doctors, engineers, priests. Schools and colleges will be established. The arts and sciences will flourish. But this was just part of Wakefield's vision. He also saw colonies as critical for Britain's economy. The key thing that he understood was that Britain was expanding at a huge rate. I mean, the population was expanding, the railway age had arrived, and the factories are booming, and they needed raw materials, and also markets. So he he saw this thing, which is still going on today, (laughs) that... If you put these planned, organised settlements in Australia, New Zealand and Canada, they would create markets for British goods and that those colonies would send raw materials for, uh, to create the goods. And I discovered it was actually Edward Gibbon Wakefield who coined the idea of Britain as the workshop of the world. That's why I think that, especially later in the 19th century, people did regard him as a bit of a visionary in in the context of the development of the British Empire. The problem was that Wakefield's reputation had taken such a hammering that he couldn't promote his ideas publicly. Like all those quotes you heard earlier, they all come from a book called A Letter from Sydney. Wakefield published it under a fake identity. He wrote as if he was a rich colonist in Australia, not a convicted child abductor in Newgate Prison. Uh, Somebody called him uh, uh, the Great Spider, (laughs) weaving this web, this network of people to bring his ideas into action. He couldn't actually directly do it himself. So you have to (laughs) hand it to his, if you like, his um, charisma and uh, gift of the gab and his writing and persuading a whole group of people that, yeah, that doesn't sound too bad, I'll put some money into that. 
Wakefield's web was made up of some pretty powerful figures, members of the aristocratic class with names like Lord Durham and Lord Hutt. Now, if you recognise that second name, it's because the whole Hutt Valley is named after him. In fact, there are tonnes of places around Wellington which are named after Wakefield's wealthy benefactors. Lampton Quay, Evans Bay, Lyle Bay, Molesworth Street. Through these men, Wakefield had huge influence. Lord Durham actually sent him to Canada, where he was instrumental in developing a new Canadian constitution. Next, he was heavily involved in planning new settlements in South Australia. This was the first chance to test his new theories on colonisation. But Wakefield ended up pulling out of that scheme early on. Partly because his bad reputation was causing problems for the project, but also because of a family tragedy. In 1835, Wakefield's daughter, Nina, died from tuberculosis. She was just 17 years old. Nina had been one of Wakefield's closest confidants. She had regularly visited him in prison and shared his enthusiasm for his colonisation schemes. Again, he wrote to his sister Catherine to express his grief. The vulgar notion of death holds no terrors for me. But I feel more than half dead myself, having lost her for whom alone of late years I have lived. From this point on, Edward Gibbon Wakefield virtually never spoke about the two loves of his life, Nina and Eliza. He never attempted to remarry or foster any intimate relationships. He was even distant with his own son, Jerningham. Instead, he threw himself completely into his work. And by now, that work had a new target. Very near to Australia, there is a country which all testimony concurs in describing as the fittest country in the world for colonisation, as the most beautiful country with the finest climate and the most productive soil. I mean New Zealand. Wakefield became the driving force behind the New Zealand Company, a group of rich and powerful men who promoted the establishment of a new British colony in Aotearoa based on Wakefield's ideas of systematic colonisation. Working with the New Zealand Company, he produced more than 200 books and pamphlets pushing New Zealand as the ideal place to colonise. Great valleys occupied with the most beautiful rivers. Their feet washed by the ceaseless South Sea swell. Their flanks clothed with the grandest of primeval forests. The amenity and salubrity of its climate makes for the peculiar adaptation of the country for the residents of a great commercial and manufacturing people. Yeah, images of paradise. I mean, the level of some of this propaganda really <laughs> astonished me. I think the one in your book, which I liked the best, was that they painted these um, complete 360-degree panoramas, which you could stand in the middle of, mm. and it was supposedly the spot where the settlement would be. And it was sort of like, you know, the 19th century version of, of virtual reality, where you could sort yes. of be transported yes. to the spot and see, oh, here's where my house could go, and, and this is where the farm will be, and all this kind of stuff. That's right. I know. The South Pacific, um, and including New Zealand, were painted as a kind of the Paradise Islands, you know, where everything was abundant and fertile and um, uh, compared to an increasingly overcrowded and grimy uh, uh, England. Yes, Jerusalem in, a, in another land, you know. Wakefield was a master of propaganda. The New Zealand company even arranged to ship a Māori man called Naiti to London so he could promote the idea of a British colony with statements like this. I like it. I do not know what my countrymen would like. I think they would like it too because they like even the bad people now. I think they would like the gentlemen. It's hard to know if Naiti really did think colonisation would be good for Māori or if he was just saying what the New Zealand company was paying him to say. 
Wakefield himself waved away any concerns about the effects of colonisation on indigenous people. The common effect of mere colonisation has been to exterminate the Aboriginal race. This, however, is not a plan of mere colonisation. It has for its object to civilise as well as to colonise. He said the settlers would adopt and instruct Māori. The colonists would be civilising a barbarous people who could scarcely cultivate the earth. And of course, Māori would be super keen to welcome the settlers. After all, according to Wakefield, they saw your average English person as being so eminently superior to himself that the idea of asserting his own independence of equality never enters his mind. So yeah, this sounds super racist from today's perspective, and we should point out he said all this stuff despite never having visited New Zealand himself. But of course, Wakefield wasn't alone with those kind of beliefs. There were very few people who considered that Aboriginals, for example, or Māori, were on the same civilizational level as they were. I mean, missionaries... <clears throat> believe this in a different way, that they have, uh, all Māori had to be Christianised so they would get the proper Christian values. So basically most people in Britain agreed that Māori were inferior, but that didn't mean everyone thought colonisation was a good idea. In fact, the British government repeatedly turned down proposals to colonise New Zealand. Why? Well, a senior figure in the colonial office said it would lead to the conquest and extermination of the present inhabitants. By this point in British history, there was actually a pretty strong indigenous rights movement. It was partly a reaction to the horrific treatment of Native Americans in the USA. Right around this time in the 1830s, 60,000 Native Americans were forced off their land in the so-called Trail of Tears. About 4,000 of them died in the process some British people worried the same thing could happen in New Zealand, particularly the Church Missionary Society and a group called the Aborigines Protection Society. I think New Zealand was fortunate that the Aborigines Protection Society and the, and the, Church, and the um, Church Missionary Society had such a big influence on uh, colonial office policy in the late 1830s and 40s, which enabled things like the Treaty of Waitangi a big part of why the Treaty of Waitangi was dreamed up in the first place was to block speculators and opportunists, like the New Zealand Company, from setting up colonies in Aotearoa, particularly Article 2. The chiefs of the United Tribes and the individual chiefs yield to Her Majesty the exclusive right of preemption over such lands as the proprietors thereof may be disposed to alienate. To put that in plain English, the treaty would prevent Māori from selling land to anyone other than the British government, particularly not private speculators like the New Zealand Company. For Wakefield, this was a disaster. Remember, his whole theory of systematic colonisation depended on buying land cheaply from indigenous people, then selling it on to rich settlers and using the profits to ship labourers to the colony. That was the only way the company could work. Get the land for... Sweet bugger all, you know, blankets and knives and muskets. <laughs> At this point, most people would probably give up and go back to the drawing board. But not Edward Gibbon Wakefield. He figured there was still a narrow chance to make his vision a reality. Get to New Zealand, and in particular Wellington, before Hobson could negotiate a treaty with Māori. But there was only a tiny window of time. The company only had a few months to get to New Zealand and negotiate with Māori to buy land for their settlements before the treaty was signed. Rushing the whole damn thing, of course, was a recipe for disaster. In the next episode, we're going to see Wakefield's theories about colonisation run headfirst into some bitter realities. (music) 
Special thanks to Dr. Philip Temple. For more information about Edward Gibbon Wakefield, I highly recommend his book, A Sort of Conscience. If you enjoyed this podcast, make sure to subscribe and give us a review on Apple Podcasts. You can also find the show on all kinds of other podcast platforms, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and of course on the RNZ app. You can also find tons of other great RNZ podcasts. In fact, all our award-winning radio shows have their own podcasts. Morning Report, Checkpoint, 9 to Noon, Saturday Morning with Kim Hill. They're all there. Black Sheep is written by me, William Ray. The executive producer is Tim Watkin, and our sound engineer is Mark Chesterman. Our voice actors are Duncan Smith, Adam McCauley, Eva Corlett, Jim Moriarty, and Mediana Johnson. Hey, it's Ryan Reynolds, owner and user of Mint Mobile. And I am recording this message on my phone. I'm literally on my Mint phone. Why? Because fancy recording studios cost money. And if we spent money on things like that, we couldn't offer you screaming deals. Like if you sign up now for three months, you get three months free on every one of your plans, even unlimited. Visit mintmobile.com slash switch. Limited time, new customer offer. Activate within 45 days. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. Unlimited customers using more than 40 gigabytes per month will experience lower speeds. Video streams at 480p. See mintmobile.com for details.